So in this video, we're going to be talking about ancient North Africa, about what's going on on the southern side of the Mediterranean. And so, you know, one way of looking at this is to say that there are, you know, there's multiple North Africas. Um, you know, the, there's the, the North Africa that is along the coastline, that is, um, that is uh, populated with cities, uh, colonies founded by the Greeks, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and other um, urban centers uh, that are part of the, you know, the, the connectedness of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, we have the, the Africa of Egypt, which is connected vertically along the Nile and so you know, binds up with it the nations to the south of Egypt, uh, namely uh, Nubia, um, Kush, uh, Punt, uh, that kind of thing. And then uh, there's the, the world of the Sahara, uh, the world of, the, uh, of, of, of deserts that uh, lies between the coastlands and uh, the lands to the south, uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, uh, all of these worlds are, are more or less disconnected with each other by the, the difficulty of traversing the, the Sahara. But uh, there, you know, there was a... a uh, there was uh, civilization in all of these places, and there was a, a connectedness uh, to the extent possible uh, in terms of, of commerce and ideas uh, that uh, that plays out um, uh, 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 as part of the history of the of the Mediterranean world. Uh, so you know, Egypt is is as I said connected vertically along the Nile, and uh, they uh, undertook a great deal of, of interaction with the peoples to the south. Um, uh, part of that interaction is cultural. In other words, the the people of of Nubia, also known as Kush, uh, uh, you know, imbibed a great deal of Egyptian culture and uh, assimilated uh, you know Egyptian architecture and uh, and religion. Although, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Nubian religion uh, accepted the Egyptian pantheon, but added a, a, a god that was particular to themselves, a particular Nubian deity that, uh, that, whose role in, uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the divine was to look after the Nubians, particularly, uh, you know, if you remember that uh, Egyptian religion is all about the nurturing nature of the gods, this is, uh, this is very interesting and, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is, is part of the context of the way in which the, the Nubians fought fiercely to hold on to their separate identity uh, in the wake of their exploitation over you know century after century by the Egyptians and uh, the the they were successful in doing so and, you know the 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 Egyptians took a great deal from the Nubians in terms of resources and and uh, and uh, even you know uh, manpower in terms of labor but uh, the, the the Nubians held on to their their sense of self their 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 sense of of national identity strongly enough that when the Egyptians were in trouble, uh, the the Nubians were able to um, to uh, to to come to the aid of the Egyptians to fight off uh, foreign invaders and to establish a a Kushite dynasty in in Egypt that uh, that helped to protect Egypt from outsiders uh, and uh, you know in some ways. Uh, was was uh, was a return was sometimes was in some ways a a reestablishment of the the good old days in which um, you know the Nubia and Egypt were part of uh, a, a larger Egyptian empire and so uh, you know, the, the 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 Nubians the Kushites are far from being only uh, victims they are a part of the the, the story of Egypt. Um, more isolated, the, the great uh, trading city of, of Punt uh, uh, toward the, the southern end of the, the Red Sea is, uh, is, is less known to us because we, uh, we know about it only indirectly through, uh, through stories and records that are, uh, that are left behind by the Egyptians. Uh, Punt itself uh, hasn't uh, been uh, archaeologically uh, uh, excavated. Uh, and uh, you know we have no relics directly from them, so it's all about going to this this magical great uh, commercial city beyond 
the you know domain beyond the purview of the Egyptians and finding things there that are you know that are are exotic and and uh, and foreign uh, you know goods and materials that and and people that come from far beyond the Egyptian world and fascinated the Egyptians and brought them home with them uh, essentially you know punt is is the Egyptian connection to a larger world beyond the their immediate uh, environment at the eastern end of the Mediterranean uh, and suggests to us that uh, even in the you know the earliest days of, of, of civilization the earliest centuries of, of the Bronze Age uh, there was a, a trade network in the Indian Ocean and Punt would have been an ideal location for connection between uh, the, you know, the 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 African coast, what is now you know uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and um, a larger world to the east that would have connected maybe you know African uh, Eastern African uh, communities in in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and uh, um, you know the the Arabian Peninsula and uh, uh, the the Indian subcontinent at a time when you know. Uh, you know when communities and trade are are just starting to flourish in those locations as well. The Sahara itself. So the first thing to say about Sahara is that uh, the Sahara of the ancient world might not be exactly the same as it is now. In other words, it's still a desert. And remember that the, the word desert means uh, um, deserted. In other words, it is not uh, uh, you know populated by large numbers of people. Uh, it is not invested with uh, with with cities as a general rule. But uh, there has been some shift in the climate uh, over the last, uh, you know, five thousand years, such that there were, you know, more. Uh, still a very small number, but uh, there were locations in this in the world of the Sahara where it was possible through great ingenuity to uh, to create a, a an urban. You know scenario to uh, to uh, to practice agriculture uh, and uh, and you know pastoral uh, you know keeping up domesticated animals uh, to use um, you know deep wells to uh, to to provide access to to water and so forth. So even without you know large amounts of rainfall uh, or you know on, on, you know very minimal amounts of rainfall, uh, there were communities in uh, uh, in the Sahara that created. Uh, centralized, fixed uh, cities, and these served as as hubs of communication across the Sahara, so that uh, you know the the communities that existed in the Sahara would be along trade routes that connected further south to uh, uh, the hubs that uh, opened up the sub-Saharan world. Like you know, further south is the great city of Timbuktu that lies on the on the edge between the world of the Sahara uh, and the world of, of Niger and uh, you know the sub-Saharan. Uh, 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 populations. Uh, the rest of the Sahara is, uh, is you know, is, is the people that live there are characterized by a nomadic life. Uh, these are referred to in a very broad sense as the Berbers, although Berber is, is a word that is used to, uh, you know, describe them by outsiders. But generally speaking, these are, are peoples that are, you know, that uh, they find their way to you know locales that uh, that they can live in for a temporary period of time where they have access to water and oases you know uh, places of of, uh, of, uh, of 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 vegetation and water you know in the middle of the desert uh, and and you know the the then you know when uh, when the time is right they move on and so you know the 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 berber population of north africa is also part of the connections between these would be peoples that are uh, participating in the movement of trade uh, uh, north and south across the Sahara to a certain extent also east and west in other words uh, the nomadic peoples of the Sahara would have been part of the connection between uh, the Egyptian world to far to the east and, and uh, you know the rest of North Africa but uh, you know it's the it's the these that are the you know the the indigenous inhabitants that are later encountered um, by uh, the the, the peoples that uh, try to uh, you know try to uh, build power bases on the North African coast, uh, you know first of all the the Phoenicians, uh, later the Greeks, and ultimately the Romans who expand their empire deep into the Saharan world. 
the Phoenician traders uh, create a, a great deal of transformation in North Africa through the establishment of multiple colonies along the coast that uh, trade uh, good f goods from the interior uh, with uh, the goods that the Phoenicians have to offer. And so the, the, there develops a, a demand uh, at these coastal trading points for you know the natural resources and other things that come from the interior, uh, and and so as a result, the these Phoenician cities, uh, even though they they stick to the coast, have a you know great impact on the extent to which the all of the North Africa's have a chance to uh, become uh, at least tenuously connected, and you know of course the the most uh, important of these colonies is the what becomes the great city of Carthage. Carthage, according to legend, is founded somewhere in the 9th century by Phoenician traders, and it becomes a, a flourishing, uh, extremely wealthy uh, trading city. The location of Carthage is, is ideal for trade. First of all, it has an excellent uh, harbor, which uh, the the Carthaginians expand upon and uh, and uh, and and uh, from this develop a a massive uh, uh, marine presence in terms of trade and uh, backed up where necessary by naval military power. Uh, and, but uh, you know, on top of this, Carthage is situated at the ideal point. Uh, to control trade between the eastern Mediterranean and the western Mediterranean. It sits right on top of the, the narrow passage between, uh, between uh, North Africa and Sicily, which is you know, what we're looking at here in the distance. And so as a result, uh, Carthage is in a position to dominate western Mediterranean trade and to uh, you know, facilitate and, and, uh, and govern the, the trade that takes place between the Western Mediterranean and uh, the peoples of the East. And Carthage is so successful in doing so, so powerful, so wealthy, that um, the, the strength of Carthage uh, far outlasts the, uh, the, the power of the Phoenician cities that gave birth to it. In other words, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, the, the Phoenician cities that uh, Tyre and Sidon and so forth come under uh, the rule of the... Uh, um, of the the Seleucids and the Romans and lose their, uh, you know, lose their uh, lose their independence, uh, you know, very early on. Uh, they they uh, they're actually, uh, you know, along with the uh, the Israelis, they f they fall foul to the the Neo Assyrians uh, even before the Persians come along. Uh, but uh, Carthage remains powerful and independent, you know, all the way up until the the city is defeated and then physically destroyed by the Romans in uh, uh, in 146 BCE. Uh, Carthage, in other words, is, is is the most powerful trading city of the west of the Western Mediterranean, um, which is its own sort of uh, insular lake because it's it's cut off from the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, all the civilization it develops in the east and concentrates around the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Western Mediterranean is uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, it falls essentially to Carthage until Rome rises up and becomes Carthage's nemesis. And, and uh, the earliest tests for Rome involve rivalry with, uh, with Carthage and the need to eliminate Carthage in order to uh, bring about its own dominance of, uh, the, uh, of the Western Mediterranean. So in that sense, uh, Carthage and Rome, there's a certain parallel between uh, Carthage and Rome, and the Mycenaeans and Troy. Uh, Mycenaeans uh, and Troy become rivals for control of trade in the Aegean, and ultimately the Mycenaeans decide that Troy has to be eliminated so that the Mycenaeans can have a monopoly on Aegean trade. And uh, you know the same ends up being true in the Western Mediterranean. Carthage is the dominant force in the trade of the Western Mediterranean, and as Rome rises up, it realizes that in order to establish itself, in order to become powerful, it must eliminate Carthage. Uh, and this is what it eventually does. Learning how to do so is the way in which the Romans uh, find their way to uh, uh, creating a model of, of empire that uh, serves it very well for 
the next, uh, you know, 1,200 years and more. And so uh, the, the rest of the story will be about, uh, you know, how the Romans develop the idea of civilization and, and uh, the idea of empire and bring to a culmination the story of the ancient world. Uh, 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 the, the great city of Carthage has a great deal to do with this. Uh, uh, there are still uh, remnants of Carthage left that you can visit, but, uh, you know, the, the, the potency of Carthage was what uh, the Romans had to face in order to become what they were, didn't even know they were destined to be, and uh, uh, the 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 story of the Western Mediterranean is is about that that rivalry about uh, about that. It's only after the Romans uh, you know face their test against Carthage and come to dominate the Western Mediterranean that the Romans even turn to the east. The position of Carthage, the position of Rome in in the Western Mediterranean, is a matter of geography. Uh, a matter of, of trade, a matter of commerce, and you know these are the foundations of, of empire, more than ambition, more than glory, more than military power. And we'll see how that turns out over the next few weeks for now, that's that.